to this Sunday's worship video. My name is Reverend Anna Flowers and I'm the pastor of United Church in Walpole. And I wanna welcome you this Sunday to United Church in Walpole, which technically is coming to you from the great state of Michigan today. That's right, I am currently in Michigan where I have been celebrating and welcoming the birth of my very first niece or nephew, our family welcomed Asa Snow and Bus Newman into our hearts this week. My sister just had this beautiful little baby boy, and we are over the moon um, here in Michigan, loving on him and welcoming him into our family. And while this is a great joy to be celebrating new life in my own family, I also recognize that this Sunday, this week, we are connected to the great circle of life. This Sunday, we celebrate All Saints Sunday in the church, where we lift up all the saints and all the souls who have died, but still remain alive in our hearts and in God's kingdom. Friends, we are so glad to have you here this day for this truly beautiful service where we celebrate the gift of life and the passage of death. And we acknowledge and recognize that this year in particular has been a year where we have felt more so than ever the great um, beauty and tragedy of life and of death. This Sunday, we acknowledge and recognize that at the point of my filming this, 228,000 people in our country alone have died from this great pandemic in the last few months. Um, and we also know that all sorts of other loved ones in our lives have passed away this year from all kinds of other ailments and natural causes. And, um, and our hearts come into this service heavy with that truth, but also heavy with um, and alive with the Spirit of God. So in that spirit, I welcome you into this sacred space and into this sacred time of worship. Every Sunday at United Church in Walpole, we want to make sure that um, folks know who and why and how we welcome everyone, everyone, everyone. And so we begin our service this way. Welcome to United Church in Walpole. Welcome to all who have no church home, need strength, want to follow Jesus, have doubts, or do not believe. Welcome to new visitors and to old friends. Welcome to grandparents, to parents, to uh, aunties and uncles, to folks with no children, to children themselves, the tiny little babies and the bigger teenagers. Welcome to those without any children. Welcome to all people in all walks of life. Welcome to those um, who have no church home. Welcome to those who are searching for something more. Welcome um, to people of all colors, all cultures, all abilities, all sexual orientations and gender expressions, to old and young, to believers and questioners, and welcome to questioning believers. Welcome to everyone here at United Church in Walpole, no matter where United Church in Walpole happens to be, whoever you are, and wherever you are on your life's journey, you are welcome here. Hi, I'm Katie Taxeri. Good morning to you all. I hope all of you are doing well. This has been a very long and uh, very difficult time from, from all of us. My family is all well, thank God. Um, Traveling is not in the in the picture right now, so I have grandchildren that I haven't seen. And but I do have a new grandson on the way, which is really exciting. And uh, I've been working full time. We're really busy, and it's so nice to hope uh, be with you as we can be. Love to all. In all of our weaknesses and strengths with our youth-filled spirits and aging bodies. We come to be your people, O oh God. 
strong in faith and eager with questions, singing our praise and whispering our prayers. We come to be your people, O God. Filled with saintly determination, yet mindful of our human limitations, we come to be your people, O God. Made strong in your endless love for us, we know ourselves to be yours, and we come to be your people, O God. May we truly become your people today. Amen. Longing for light, we wait in darkness. Longing for truth, we turn to you. Make us your own, your holy people. Light for the world to see. Christ, be our light. Shine in our hearts, shine through the darkness. Christ, be our light. Shine in your church, gather today. Longing for peace, our world is troubled. Longing for hope, many despair. Your word alone has power to save us. Make us your living voice. Christ, be our light. Shine in our hearts. Shine through the darkness. Christ, be our light. Shine in your church, gather today. Many the gifts, many the people, many the hearts that yearn to belong. Let us be servants to one another, making your kingdom come. Christ, be our light, shine in our hearts, shine through the darkness. Christ, be our light, shine in your church, gather today. Our scripture reading today is for All Saints Sunday, is from the book of Revelation, chapter 21, verses 1 through 7. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of the heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his peoples. And God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water as a gift from the spring of water of life. Those who conquer will inherit these things, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. May God add a blessing to this reading, hearing, and understanding of these words.
Last week, I met with the worship team at my church to talk about how we can make All Saints Day especially meaningful. We spent a good bit of time on that part of the service where my associate was going to read the names of those church members who had died in the last year. And part of that time was spent wondering what we should call it. We finally settled on remembering the saints. But one of the resources I consulted suggested the naming of the honored dead. Nobody liked that. Why is that, I asked. Why do we have such a hard time with the word dead? We say that our loved ones passed away or that they went home to be with the Lord, but we rarely say that they died. Why is that? Because it sounds so final, someone said, like it's not only the end of their earthly life, but the end of them somehow. And we don't want to believe that. No. We don't want to believe that. But what leads us to believe anything else? Where do we get the idea that death is not the end of our loved ones? In Old Testament times, people believed that when their loved ones died, they went down to Sheol, the place of the dead, which was literally down there somewhere. It wasn't hell, not a place of punishment for the wicked, it was just a place people went after they died, a kind of huge underground warehouse. I don't know if their loved ones thought that they walked around down there like guests at a cocktail party, or if they thought they were stacked like cordwood in the corner. But if you had asked somebody in those days where their great-grandfather was, they would have pointed down at the ground and whispered, Sheol, the place of the dead. But sometime in the second century BC, people began to talk about resurrection from the dead. You get the first hint of this in the Bible from Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, which says, Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Whereas Sheol was understood to be simply the place of the dead, both the righteous and the wicked, the book of Daniel suggests that the dead who are raised will be judged and will receive everlasting reward or punishment based on what they did in life. Like the story Jesus tells in Luke 16 about Lazarus and the rich man. After poor Lazarus dies, he is comforted in the bosom of Abraham. But the rich man who didn't lift a finger to help Lazarus in life ends up in Hades. He calls out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. But Father Abraham says, nothing doing. You had your chance. The rest of the New Testament supports this same basic view that the righteous will be rewarded with everlasting life and the wicked will be punished with everlasting death. The question then becomes, how do I attain righteousness? How can we attain everlasting life? And while the Pharisees from the second century BC forward believed that it was a matter of being holier than everybody else, Jesus introduced the idea that it wasn't our goodness, but God's grace that saved us. And Paul, who had worn himself out as a Pharisee trying to keep the rules of righteousness, further developed that idea. In Galatians 2.16, he says, We know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. In Romans 10.9, he says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. In the space of a few hundred years then, some people went from believing that death was the end to believing that death was not the end at all. They even began to believe that the life that comes after death is the best life of all. And that was a huge comfort to them, especially under the circumstances. I'm preaching from the book of Revelation today, and I doubt that there is any book in the Bible that has been more misunderstood. Because it is full of signs and symbols, some people try to decode it as if it were a Dan Brown novel. 
Back when I was a boy, there was a book called The Late Great Planet Earth, in which Hal Lindsey supposedly explained all the mysteries of Revelation. He talked a lot about the Antichrist, a word that is not even used in Revelation. He talked about the rapture, which again is not a word used in that book, and an idea that is suggested only in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Lindsay believed that there were references to Russia throughout the book of Revelation, although he couldn't find where the United States fit in. Finally, he predicted that the world would come to an end in 1988. He was wrong. A decade ago, the Left Behind series picked up where Lindsay left off, as Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins delved into the secrets of Revelation in novel form. It was exciting stuff, fascinating, but with no more basis in reality than the late great planet Earth. The book of Revelation is full of signs and symbols, there's no doubt about that. But the signs and symbols would have been readily understood by the people for whom it was written near the end of the first century. Revelation is apocalyptic literature, just like the second half of the book of Daniel and some portions of the Gospels. It was written for people who were undergoing persecution as a way of helping them stay strong in their faith. At the time Revelation was written, Caesar Domitian was the emperor of Rome, and he was persecuting Christians just as Caesar Nero had before him. Nero used to soak Christians in creosote and then set them on fire to light his garden parties. Domitian had them put to death sometimes boiled in oil, if they did not bow down before his statue and say, Caesar is Lord. And if they didn't receive his mark on their hand or forehead, they couldn't buy or sell in the marketplace. Under those circumstances, the writer of Revelation begs Christians to stay true to the faith and assures them that even if the worst happens, even if they are killed for insisting that Jesus, not Caesar, is Lord, it will not be the end of the story for them. Earlier in the book, he has written about how the beast, Domitian, rose to power and how he began to persecute the people of God. But then he looks to the future, and in the vision God has given him, he sees how the beast will come to his end and how Rome, the great harlot, will be brought to shame. And then it gets worse, or better, depending on your perspective, as he talks about a time when God's wrath will be poured out upon the earth in great bowls and the last battle will be fought, a time when dead bodies will be strewn in heaps across the landscape and blood will run as high as a horse's bridle. Only then, he says, will this cosmic conflict be over. Only then will the kingdom of this world become the kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ. Only then will He begin to reign forever and ever. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I try to remember that sometimes when people come to my study wanting to talk, I try to remember that because sometimes they are in dire straits facing trouble so deep they don't know how they will get out of it. They talk to me with tears on their cheeks, explaining situations that seem impossible. And often in those sessions I am led to say, you know, this is terrible. It sounds impossible, but we don't know yet how this story will end. A good storyteller will tell you that every plot has to have some complications in it, some problems that seem impossible to resolve. A good storyteller will resolve those complications in front of an audience in such a way that they are amazed and astounded by how impossible situations have suddenly become possible. We don't know yet, I say, how this story is going to end, but let's keep praying about it. Let's keep asking God to help us see the way. It seems like good advice. People often seem to be comforted by it. They dry their tears and go out of my study saying over and over to themselves, we don't know yet. We don't know how this story is going to end. It could end beautifully, better than I ever expected. 
we don't know yet. Yesterday afternoon, when my family got email from an old friend letting us know that her father had died, I wanted to tell her something else. I wanted to say, you know, we do know how this story will end. The writer of Revelation has told us. I picture it like you would see it acted out in a theater with all that carnage and bloodshed up there on the stage, all those battles being fought, all that smoke going up. The story is at its worst in that moment, and you wonder how it can ever have a happy ending. But then the writer of Revelation talks about the curtain being closed, the stage being cleared, and in the darkness we sit and wait to see what the next act will bring. There is silence in the theater for some time, and then the sound of music, maybe only a single flute as the curtain begins to open, and you see the stage bathed in light, heavenly light. And then the writer of Revelation tells us, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven like a bride adorned for her husband. According to the author of Revelation, when God gets good and ready, this is the way God is going to end the story. He's going to clear the stage of all that bloodshed and carnage. He's going to mop up the awful mess we have made of things. He's going to make a new heaven and a new earth, and then He's going to bring heaven to earth quite literally. He's going to set the holy city smack dab down in the middle of things like an enormous wedding cake so that His people can come streaming in toward those pearly gates from every direction, and the marriage supper of the Lamb can begin. But wait, that's not all. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them as their God. They will be His peoples, and God Himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eye. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. So the question we began with is answered. Death is not the end. In the end, God will make an end of death itself, and the last word will be the word of life. I can almost picture God standing there at the gate, welcoming one after another of His saints, wiping the tears from their eyes, pulling them close in a bone-breaking hug, and then ushering them into His kingdom. All those people who have suffered and died for their faith in Jesus, as well as those people whose names will be read in churches on this Sunday, all those people who have loved God and been loved by Him, all those saints. So may it be. Amen. Now we meet and rest 
In the presence of our Lord we gather. In the presence of our Lord we gather. Today, as we celebrate the communion or the co-union with all of those who have passed before us, we also have the opportunity to celebrate the co-union, the communion um, of, that we share with one another and with God through God's abundant table. So I invite you now to get anything that you have in your house to take communion with, any ordinary food, any ordinary drink because that's what the real communion was originally um, all about. Just the food that we have, the food that God gives us. Nothing special, but everything to sustain our life. And so get what you have, bring it, and let us celebrate God's abundance and our co-union with one another and with God. Now, as we approach the table this day, uh, we do so seeking to um, purify our hearts and purify our spirits and purify our lives. And we do that by acknowledging that we are not perfect people and yet also hearing the grace that we do not need to be perfect to be loved. And we are always invited to be real and authentic with God about our own um, our own faults, our own sins, and our own hearts that want to do better. And so in that spirit, we pray together our prayer of confession. Merciful God, forgive me for the things I have done and not done. Forgive me for the things I have said and not said. Forgive me for the life I have lived and not lived that I might reflect the image of the one I profess to follow in thought, word, and deed, and in discovering my true self, draw others into that light. Amen. Well, friends, on this day, you are forgiven. Whatever you have done or not done, said or not said, lived or not lived, God is inviting you into a new life, and that life begins right here and right now. And in the spirit of that grace, we now can taste um, and see the goodness of God. And we remember that on the night before Jesus gave himself up, he took ordinary bread, just what was on his table. And after giving thanks to God, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in like manner, after supper, he poured out what was on his table. It was wine, but in this case, I have water. Perhaps you have um, water or some other um, drink at your house. Whatever you have, know this. After Jesus poured out this drink, he gave thanks to God and said, this is the cup of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. And this day, 
We invite the Holy Spirit to come into my house, into your house, and into your hearts, saying, come Holy Spirit, come. Bless this bread and bless this fruit of the vine. Bless all of us in our eating and drinking at this table that our eyes may be opened and we might recognize the risen Christ in our midst and in each other. I now invite you to pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, friends, I now invite you to take what you have and what you have blessed And remember that this is the body of Christ, which is given for you. And this is the cup of blessing. Gracious God, we have been joined together as one body. Let us go from this table as a renewed people doing the radical work of Jesus that calls us to live lives of faith. We are followers of God's way. We are never alone. God walks beside us and we give thanks. This Sunday, as we begin our offering time, I want to introduce you to an organization that is near and dear to all of our hearts here at United Church in Walpole. And that is an organization that our church has been uh, a part of for probably over 150 years, and that's called City Mission Society and, and City Mission Boston. Now, City Mission is an old, old organization that has roots that go back way back into our congregational heritage in the 1800s, where churches outside of Boston and in Boston and all around Massachusetts have come together to serve the poor right in the city of Boston and to be God's hands and feet in that way. And that organization, we are proud to say, has continued on and continued to change and adapt and meet all kinds of needs. And our relationship with City Mission continues to live on. So I hope that you um, take some time right now to watch this video about City Mission and learn a little bit more about this great organization that our church is proud to support. The City of Boston benefits in an amazing way from this organization that's rooted in Boston. It's, it began here, it started here, it was one of the first area mission societies where the churches combined with the social needs of the community. And that's a rich history and there isn't any other organization that has it. Yeah, we've been there a couple times. I got to know June Cooper and the legacy of City Mission Society. And the thing that impressed me the most about them is that they had not only roots back, you know, in its history to 1853, but also uh, wings, and they always adapted to new situations in Boston. The part that I think that's really unique is that we listen to people. We like to hear their voices. The way that we like to work is around this whole concept and idea of mutuality, so that our programs are not top-down. We go into neighborhoods or go into congregations and try to find out what the most pressing needs are, and in that way, Things grow organically. The group from New Hampshire, a group of uh, teenagers, came down for our Boston Urban Outreach, volunteered their time on a Saturday, and they came in and they cleaned it from top to bottom. They washed chairs, did floors, windows, and when they finished, I mean, it's just a marvelous sight to go up and see the this, this, this spectacular shine on the, on the chairs, the, the wood, you can see it and it was refreshed and, and vibrant and the windows, you could see the sunshine through and the colors, it, it was, it's magnificent. You know, 
Toronto City Mission Society makes a real, genuine effort to work directly with people in the community and on a hands-on level. And I think um, a lot of times those kind of efforts go unsupported and unnoticed and I feel like you know, it's very important for a program like City Mission Society to, to get the uh, support that it needs to continue doing what it's, what it's trying to do. With what's going on in Boston now with our youth, we have to act immediately. We have to save this generation of youngsters. We have an opportunity with your investment in the City Mission Society is to affect change in Boston, all for the positive. And we all have a lot to give, but in giving, we receive back so much more. And that is a mantra that we share and talk a lot about. And it is, a, it is informed by the gospel, as the gospel encourages us to give, um, not always out of our wealth, but out of what we have. And oftentimes we find that we have, when we dig deeper, we find that we have more, more riches than we can even contain. City Mission is just one of the many organizations that United Church in Walpole supports with our finances and also with our hands and hearts, uh, rolling up our sleeves and getting out there. But we do support them financially, knowing that sometimes financial contributions can help make the biggest impact for folks in need. And so we invite you now to give financially to our church so we can continue to support organizations like City Mission and so much more. Our morning offering will now be given and gratefully received. May these gifts and offerings be used to do your will and to do your mission work in the city of Boston and all around the world. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And the 
video today, I ask that God bless you and keep you. I ask that God's um, graciousness shine upon you and that you feel the blessings of God inside and outside, that you feel connected to those you have loved and you have lost from this earth, and that you know that um, the worst things in life, even death itself, is never the last thing. This is the grace of God, the God who created you, the God who came to save you and to redeem you, and the God who is with you always. Amen. Amen.